Happy Saturday, everybody. Happy Saturday. <laughs> you, know, you know that's my greeting. Yeah. And um, I want to uh, thank everyone for joining us here this afternoon. And as, as you uh, know, this was to be a debate uh, between the mayoral candidates. And as you also know, uh, according to uh, Commissioner uh, <laughs> Tafis, it seems like uh, there is somebody who is afraid to be here. But I, I don't know. I don't, <laughs> see, there's Commissioner Davis once again. <laughs> I, I don't know that that's, that's a fact, but uh, that, that's what I'm hearing. However, we do not have any loss of courage. We do not have any loss of a man who's not afraid to look out for the residents in this community. We do not have a loss of someone who has ideas that would make a better quality of a life for us. We do not have the concern that many have. Those who say, well, I don't, I don't, I, I don't know who this person is that you're talking about, or I, I don't know where he is, and, and I keep wondering, well, are they just armchair quarterbacks? Are they just uh, sitting in their armchair someplace watching football? Rather than being concerned about their quality of life, football is fine, and the players make a boatload of money. But those who are not concerned about what's going on in the government need to wake up, extend themselves, and find out about the man who has courage, the man who is concerned about our quality of life, the man who has some plans to make our lives better. When you have someone who does not have disrespect for you, you need to know you've got to make a change. When you find out that some people have had three feet of sewage and water in their basement and all they've been offered is a bucket and a mop, how long would it take you to clear three feet of sewage and water out of your basement? with a mop and a bucket. We need to be concerned about the $600 million that has been accumulated by an overcharging of property taxes. You need to think about making a change. You need to be concerned about someone who is honest, someone who would not Tell the medical examiner, I want you to lie. I want you to say that that man died from an overdose of drugs when the man did not have drugs in his hand, did not have drugs in his clothing, did not have drugs in his car, and you wanted the medical examiner to lie, to jeopardize his license? You'd be off on your way and somebody would find out about it and he wouldn't be able to practice anymore? He got fired. But what he did was he sued the city, county. They tell me he won over $2 million. But the person who fired him maybe has no heart as well as no courage. Hmm. Two white cops went to jail for that. So does that mean that there is a person who is more concerned about his friends, his family, huh, and others who look like him than everybody. You have to be concerned about the whole city, not just those who look like you. Mm. Anyway, I'm going to now stop because when I get a microphone in front of me, I just, <laughs> how you know? <laughs> I get kind of concerned. I might want to sing a rap or something. 
But um, uh, the, the uh, candidate, uh, good rap. <laughs> you good heard rap. me, you heard me rap. <laughs> anyway, the person that you really want to hear from is to my right. He's a candidate for mayor of this city of Detroit. And be concerned that someone may walk up and say, well, I want you to write me in. How far do you think that's going to go? It seems to me that uh, perhaps candidates who have been encouraged to be write-ins for mayor have been encouraged to do that, to pull votes away from this candidate. Hmm. Hmm. Something to think about. Anyway, now I want to turn these microphones over to the candidate who did have enough respect for us to show up. Amen. And that's... That's right, and enough heart, like the Tin Man. Any, it, it, absolutely. So many that all you have to do is listen, and you will know. Mm. And that mayoral candidate is, I won't be like that woman who was on there said, Mr. Instead of giving his proper attorney, Anthony Adams. Okay. So, um, first of all, thank you, Theo, and thank you to Hood Research for your fine efforts at uplifting the intellectual body of knowledge in, in our community. It is often said that there is a strain of in anti-intellectualism that runs through the black community that we don't appreciate and respect people who have knowledge, people who have intellect, but Hood Research clearly rebuts all of those presumptions and that, it, that the concerns about intellectualism are alive and well with you being here today. My name is Anthony Adams, and I've, I am the candidate to become your mayor of the city, Troy. Let me, let me just start there. <laughs> when, when we started this journey pre-COVID, there were a lot of things that were happening in the city of Detroit. People were showing up for the first time in a long time at the Coleman A. Young Municipal Center and they were demonstrating their outrage at the fact that people have been overtaxed to the tune of $600 million. That more than 150,000 people had lost their homes as a result of tax foreclosures. That water had been shut off to about 125,000 people and that we have been reduced to a renter population, a city that is being economically exploited at every turn of the switch. Whether you go to your party store, you stop in your gas station, you go to your cleaners, you go to the beauty and barber supply store. Where do we own things in the city of Detroit? And then when we began to examine contracting in the city of Detroit, what we discovered, lo and behold, to no surprise, is that African-American contracting is at an all-time low. And so my opponent has, a, has a, a, a habit of doing the PowerPoint presentation, where he stands on stage and he has his pretty charts and he has his pretty graphs. And I say, well, let's stand on the stage and compare graphs. Let's stand on the stage and look at what's actually happening in the city of Detroit. I find it so ironic that the University of Michigan, that great institution in Ann Arbor, would come out with a housing study which demonstrated that more than 90,000 substandard units of housing actually exist in the city of Detroit. The people are living in third world conditions in the city of Detroit. I also found it amazing that Detroit Future Cities would release a report which indicated that more than 11 neighborhoods of middle income class blacks have been lost in the city of Detroit. And then when you couple that with the fact that the city of Detroit lost 93,000 African Americans over a 10 year period, and you couple that with the loss of housing, you couple that with a shortage of affordable housing in our community, people want to continue to tell us that all things are well. And I'm saying, what are you looking at? Well, if you look at objective measures of where we are, we lag far behind. Whether we look at indicia of income, where the average Detroiter single family head of household woman earns more than, less than $30,000 a year in income, that they're paying more than 50% of their income for housing. And then when you couple that with the perpetual payment plan in the city of Detroit, because you got to work out your deal with DTE, 
You got to work out your deal with the water department. You got to work out your deal with the Wayne County Treasurer. People are living in stress. And we see it because of, of the endemic gun violence that we have in our community. Well, we had more than 800 children, babies, shot and killed. Recently had a, a contract hit on a mother and a father sitting in the gas station with the baby in the car. The lack of respect for life in our community because our young men live with such a low level of hope and aspiration because no one's speaking to what they need to hear. And so when I talk about uplifting the spirit and the body of the people who live in our community, I'm talking about how we provide a level of hope for the people who live here. Far too often, the voices of people who we need to hear from are silent. They've been bought off. They've been paid off. They've been compromised. And we look for leadership, and all the leadership is compromised because everybody's so busy trying to get paid. And nobody's getting paid because when you look at where the money is flowing in Detroit, the dimes and pennies that they're getting far outstrip the billions of dollars in tax abatements and tax captures with stripping money from our libraries. Here we have a literacy issue in Detroit. We have six libraries open in the city of Detroit when we need to have 20. You talk about people not having hope, dollars not going where they need to go to, and people living in squalor, and people living without hope. So when I began this campaign, it was all about the issues. And you know, everybody knows me, know I can give you every number, fact, statistic about the city of Detroit and the condition of the people. But I've really thrown that to the curb. Because this is now about getting people to be inspired about what they need to do to take control of their own destiny. The irony of this whole election is what they try to downplay it is that the victory is sitting right there waiting on us to grab it. There's a reason why more than 35,000 people have not turned in their absentee ballots because they're trying to figure out what I need to do. There's a lot of confusion. The dark money packs which are fueling attacks on candidates of integrity and courage and people continue to sit silently by while we're out here fighting the battle. I tell people all the time, the battle is not mine. The battle is yours. I'm here to be the tip of the spirit to fight through the, the bull crap in the church, to fight through the nonsense, to fight through the disinformation, to fight through the divisiveness in our own community. We continue to be divided and we should be united because we are losing out in Detroit. If you don't believe it, again, look at the numbers. The numbers say we lost population, more than 10 percent. They complain about redistricting, and I'm saying, why are you not complaining about getting people out to vote? You all want to come back in a gubernatorial or presidential and say, we need your vote. We need your vote now. We need you to vote in people who will be responsible for what you need to get done in your life. And so when they tell us that we can't fix your flooding problem, I say that's BS. We can fix your flooding problem. We've got to do some things differently in terms of how we manage the infrastructure of our city and how we also give concern for those people who've been impacted by these decisions. Oftentimes, management decisions which are based on not providing the level of maintenance in our infrastructure and then not warning people what the issues are. The lack of transparency in this government is appalling. The secretness with which it operates and we have a lot of our council people to thank for that because they go along implicit in allowing and to empower and embolden the man who is arrogant enough to stand in the community, 75, 80 percent black, and tell them he won't debate the most qualified candidate that he ever faced in his entire life. And there's a reason why he won't do that, because he knows I'm coming with the fire, with the anger and the frustration of how people are getting screwed in this city every day. And people don't want to speak up about it. I'm sick of it. So when you get to the end of the road, the emotion, it comes out because it's compassion for the people who live in our community. I'm tired of people not caring. I'm tired of people criticizing me for fighting for people whose voices are not heard. We're going to turn this thing over. We're going to turn this thing out. And on November the 2nd, the greatest political victory that the people in this community have ever seen will be upon them. So I'm here today to answer any and every question that you might have, because I believe that you need a mayor who, has the, who is fearless enough to come into the heart of the community and talk with the people who live here. So I am Anthony Adams. I am your candidate for mayor, and I need your support. Thank you.
go through some of them, you know, because one candidate did show up. So I'm just going to go through some of these. Okay. You can spend as much time as you'd like on okay. them. Okay. These are okay. essentially quick questions. Okay. Do you support reimbursement of the uh, property tax? No. Absolutely. This whole situation is when people got overtaxed to the tune of $600 million, my opponent stood up and said, there's nothing I can do for you. Seemingly the next day, there was a decision made to expand the Stellantis plant on the east side of Detroit, and they came up with $100 million overnight to make sure that happened. And they always dangle in front of us the, the, the possibility that there might be jobs and people may be employed. And the reality is that we haven't seen one factor, one paper, one document which showed that any of the promises that they made in that decision were honored. So yes, the people need to be overpaid for the, for the overtaxation because it was an act and error on the part of government and it needs to be addressed. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Next question, would you support reopening the Nasturski power plant uh, to employ Detroiters yeah, the, the, the decision to close Mosturski and to take PLD, take the city off of its own power system is a disastrous city for the city of Detroit. Because what it did was it crippled us and made us reliant upon DTE and their overreaching and overcharging and their lack of service and what they provide to people here in the city of Detroit. And so my position is that you always need a backup, you always need a plan of action on how you're going to manage your own infrastructure and utility. And Mustersky Power Plant provided us with that ability to do so. Clearly, there would have to be some level of capital investment that would have to go into that. And trying to decouple our system from DTE would be a very difficult decision. But they need to understand that they're not the only game in town as it relates to power, that there's some power cooperatives that we should be engaged in and working with so that we can rid ourselves of being totally reliant upon DTE and the failure of them to provide even the most basic level of service in the city of Detroit. When you ride through some communities in Detroit and you look at the alleys and you look at the power lines and you see the trees overgrowing and we're wondering why we have power failures, when we stood in front of DTE and they had power out in, in, in a city for five and seven days, that's, that's unacceptable for people who live here and they need to be held accountable to do what they need to do. Increasing the number of police officers in Detroit. It's an interesting dichotomy because we always believe that having more police on the street will help us deal with our issues. But I'm consistently have said that the intersection of policing and crime and poverty are all interrelated. And that part of the problem that I see it is that we spend far more time trying to survey our population by using green night uh, technologies and other technologies that are much more reactive than being proactive in how we address the issues of crime in our community. And so part of what I have called for is that we have to spend more money in being interventional in our strategies on how we address policing in the city of Detroit. Because we understand that the people that are committing crimes have common traits. One, they have very low education levels. Two, they really have no job skills that they can market. Three, there's a high level of hope uh, in their own mindset about how they view life because you always tell you that people, I don't plan on living to 25. Well, you know, the average lifespan of a person is really about 72, 73 years old, unless you live in the city of Detroit and your average lifespan is 10 years less than our suburban community. So we have to spend more money intervening in crime, which is why this American Recovery Act money was such an opportunity to do something very transformational because when I talk about providing a pathway for citizenship, I have this program, I call it Get Your Crap Together Day, where we're saying let's bring in the gang intervention specialists, let's bring in the prosecutors, let's bring in the judges, let's bring in the social workers, let's bring in the psychologists and the psychiatrists because there's pathologies in our community where people actually need help and we clearly need to eliminate uh, the stigma of getting mental health assistance because it's killing us because people are killing themselves. And so I believe that we have to spend our dollars being interventional and providing a pathway for our young men and, and sadly our young women now who are engaging in an activity that needs to be addressed uh, substantively. It needs to be addressed with a program and plan of action. If I give you the opportunity to get your life together because of how I was raised by a single mother, Juanita Adams, who I talk about all the time because she instilled within me a, a spirit of public service I believe in the goodness of men. I believe in the goodness of the people who live in our city. 
And if you believe that people are good in your community, then you prepare to give them help. But when you served as prosecutor in our city and you were responsible for incar incarcerating thousands of African American men, your view of a black man is not what it should be because you believe that they are the worst of the, whereas I believe they're the best that we can be. Mm -hmm. the topic or issue that most concerns you regarding the city of Detroit? It's got to be neighborhood stabilization. And when I talk about neighborhood stabilization, that's multiple levels. One is the, the failure to invest in the housing of the people who live here. They created a great scenario for themselves. They created great programs that they can point to about all the new people moving into the city of Detroit and all the great financing that they can get. So if you move into the city of Detroit, you actually can get a loan based on what the value of your house will be after you rehab your home. But if you live in the city of Detroit, you can't get that same program. And so they have a lot of programs designed to bring people in the city of Detroit, but they don't have anything designed to keep people in the city of Detroit, which is why we're losing population, because people are saying, hell, I can't fix up my house, I can't afford to pay the taxes and the insurance and the water bill, then I need to move someplace where I can. And so we've got to invest the money in stabilizing people in their homes. So when you tell me you're only going to put 20 or $30 million into fixing a thousand roofs, I'm saying you haven't ridden around this city. You don't see the condition of people's houses, how they're living, with blue tarps on their roof, with collapsed front porches, with siding stripped away, with paint. You don't even know what color the paint was because it's, it's so weathered in there and they're living in squalid conditions, and they're living with the alley that's not been cleaned, and they're living in fear of their own neighbors because people don't even communicate anymore. We're talking about neighborhood stabilization. It's about how do we connect with our communities once again? How do we build the strong network of community organizations and block clubs that we used to have in the city? Well, you can't even go next door to get a cup of sugar from your neighbor because they might think you're a robber or a baron, and you end up getting blasted. How do we rebuild and connect that? How do we invest the dollars that we need to invest? If we got 800 million, we probably could have put 400 million in the housing fund just to help everybody fix up their house. The best blight removal strategy is to help somebody fix up their house. That avoids us from having an elimination of affordable housing in our community and it provides the stability that people need. People who are in fear of losing their houses, all that stress is transferred to the children and we can see it by how they act. And so there is not an understanding of the holistic approach of housing, of social justice, of equity. How do we provide child care for our, our children? All these are neighborhood stabilization programs that we have to be involved in. And then we also have to deal with the infrastructure so that people's basements aren't flooded. We got to get out there and vacuum suck the streets. We got to check to make sure the sewer lines are not broken. We got to fix collapsed sewers. We got to change the infrastructure of our, of our architecture to allow for stormwater runoff to occur uh, in parks and things like that so it's not finding up its way in somebody's basement. If you ask people whether they have their water flooding in the park or flooding in their basement, they would gladly tell you. And because these continuous con perpetual flooding is a financial strain and it's an emotional strain on people who are being impacted. Every time it rains now, I'm in mortal fear of people being flooded out of their houses and having to replace the furnace for the second or the third time and now they're being held up by Home Depot and all these other companies. Oh, you got to have the license. Con forget all that. If I can get somebody, and we all know somebody who can hook something up in the house to do it, at least make sure the gas is inspected, to do it the right way, those are the kind of things I'm talking about. And then obviously there's a security issue with how we stabilize it and provide for intervention with our neighbors so that we're living in, in peace and harmony with one another. And, uh, for instance, what is not working today? Well, what's not working is that we have a situation where we have substandard transit, and this is in spite of the heroic efforts. And I'm going to say this again because this is a story that has not been told. The men and women of DDOT who drove the buses during the height of the pandemic, who were really provided with very little assistance, Oh, they got some at the end once people started dying on the buses and complaining. But the historic men and women of DDOT performed an invaluable service for the community and continued to work nonstop through a pandemic. 
you know, a lot of us, the course was closed, so it wasn't nothing for me to do but sit at home and do Zoom calls with folk. But DDOT workers were out every day, busting their butts, driving buses to keep people moving to and from because we know we have a transit deficit in the city of Detroit. We got people that don't have cars, or if they got cars, they, the insurance is low, the coverage is low, the insurance is high, and they can't get around. So I'm going to give you the three things I would do. The first thing I got to do is I got to raise the salaries of the DDOT bus drivers. We have the lowest paid bus drivers damn near in America. They qualify for public assistance because of the wage that they, and they're driving around on a $400,000 piece of equipment. And you got somebody at a wage that they have to qualify for food stamps. That is unacceptable. When you look at the numbers of what it would take to increase the salaries of these folks up to $50,000, you're talking about a $6 million hit in a billion and a half dollar budget. That's, that's minuscule. That's a rounding error in most situations. We have to increase their salary because they deserve to get paid and they need to get some compensation for hazardous duty for what they did, but that's a whole nother discussion. The second thing is we have to actually have the parts and things that they need in order to fix the buses. If, you, if you've ever ridden a DDOT bus, and I had the pleasure of doing that, and I call it the pleasure because you meet real people on the bus. The bus is the hotel, the bus is the psychiatric hospital, <laughs> the bus is the social gathering place for people who ride the bus. And there was a community of people who ride the bus. But you gotta have the parts to fix the bus. You gotta have the mechanics that can fix. So you have to respect the, the culture of what we need to provide for a strong transportation system. We also have to think about how we transform our thinking about mobility and how we move people around from point A to point B. What we're dealing with now is a large fixed asset base that travels fixed routes, and I'm saying, where's the flexibility? We have all this technology. We know how we can track people, where movement patterns are. Most of the people who actually ride the bus in the city of Detroit actually are not working in the city of Detroit. And so when you gotta catch a bus, you gotta be at the bus stop at four o'clock because you might miss, the first bus might pass you by because it's too crowded. The second bus might not get there on time. How do we create mobility situations with technology so that we can move people to where they need to get to? The last thing we need in the city of Detroit is more service cuts on DDOT when it's been stripped down to the bare bones until the, until, the, until the bare necessity of what people really need in our community. And the whole issue of regional transportation, we need to understand that's never going to happen because obviously there's no money in it because where the money was was in water and it was quick to regionalize that. Everything where there's value in money, they take that quickly. They're not going to take DDOT. So we need to recognize that reality and bite the bullet to provide the people with service. If you had a robust transportation system, then people would be much more inclined and encouraged to use it. So we got we to gotta increase service. We got to fix the pay for the bus drivers and we got to fix the pay for the mechanics and make sure that we have the parts and then in integrate in other methods of moving people uh, through on-demand ride-sharing service so that we can provide the highest level of service that we need. Okay. And you didn't give me a time limit on my question, so I'm... <laughs> we don't need to operate off the time limit. So, next question. As mayor, can you impact the discussion of reparations? And if yes, how? And then what would you do? When you talk about reparations, I'm, clearly I'm supportive of reparations. Uh, the reparations that was a part of the Proposal P initiative was really what I supported because it was way more robust than what I call the watered-down version of what we got on the ballot today, which I'm supporting, but it's clearly watered down from what it should be. But as I told some folk the other day, they want to say the reparations has nothing to do with, with racism in Detroit. And I'm telling you, you, know, you really don't understand what happened in the city of Detroit where you had your white citizens, homeowners associations that operate the exclusion of blacks in various neighborhoods. Uh, that was state sanctioned, city sanctioned activity. The Negro removal with the urban uh, home transportation with the bus and the, um, I'm sorry, with the, um, with the uh, federal highway money, you know, moving people out of their homes. Uh, that was clear policy that was perpetuated because the roads and things were designed with the assistance of the city administration. So reparations has a unique perspective and position in what we need to do here in the city of Detroit. But if you have a mayor that understands that, we understand that reparations impacts housing. It impacts banking. It impacts insurance. How do we, how do we change what we need to do? 
I keep telling people all the time that they want to act like the city of Detroit is broke and we poor and we ain't got no money. But we're sitting on billions of dollars in our bank accounts that we have the power and authority to direct. And so when we talk about reparations and lending and providing mortgages in the city of Detroit, if you're a bank in the city of Detroit and you're holding the city of Detroit's money, then you have to lend people money in the city of Detroit for their houses. When we talk about changing housing policy and putting the affordable housing dollars behind those people who need that, then that's something that we have to do. When you're talking about giving credit, for example, for people to get hired in the city of Detroit to make it more attractive for Detroiters, if you go to Detroit Public Schools, you should be getting credit for that. If you lived in the city for a certain period of time, you should get credit for that. There are ways to create employment opportunities. Similarly, for businesses, how do we make sure that we provide our equity? And I always find it amazing that we got to talk about equity in the city of Detroit. And we're the most equitable people in the world, but we're not getting the equity in our own community. How do we make sure that there's equity uh, in the distribution of resources and assets throughout our community? And so reparations is a major portion. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mindset that you have to believe that people are entitled to get what they deserve. And I'm prepared to do that and set the budget priority so that it's reflective of the things that we need to do in our own community. Now I'm going to focus on the second part of the question, a little bit more of what could you do or would you do? Well, the first thing I would do is I, there's, a, there's, a, there's a wide range of things that can be done because when, you, when you're operating from the power of the mayor's office, you're setting the agenda. And so when we talk about, for example, housing, that's really the easiest portion of the equation that you can address because the city is controlling more than 70,000 units of housing. So how do we provide a house for people that need to be compensated because they lost their home? And that's a different kind of reparation, but it's all built into the same equation. Part of what we have here in, in the state and city of Detroit is that they have an agency known as the Michigan State Housing Development Authority, the largest affordable lender supposedly in the state of Michigan. And yet when you ask them how much they actually lend on mortgages, on home improvement loans in the city of Detroit, they don't do a dime. They're not doing their job. But then we have a governor who depends upon us for her reelection, and we have state senators and state reps who want us to vote for them. And we're saying, why are we not holding them accountable to assist us in moving our reparations agenda forward with providing housing for people uh, in the city of Detroit? When we talk about economics and providing jobs and, and employment and contract opportunities for African American companies that have been impacted by the level of structural racism that exists within the municipal contracting system because of roads that are established by the state and yet they impact local contracting. How do we ensure that the bid packages and the opportunities are designed in a manner that allow people to actually get contracts? If we got to break the contracts down further and further and further to get access to the people who we need to get to, then that's what we need to do because we owe that to the people who live in our own community. Don't continue to tell me that there are artificial barriers to making things happen when you control the barriers to what needs to be done. In the area of education, it's a, it's a big lift, but it needs to be done because the mayor needs to be an advocate for that. He needs to advocate for educational equity to address the structural issues of racism that have impacted the people and young people in our community. It's a form of reparations, but we have to, we have to force the issue. It's not going to happen if we don't force the issue, if we don't set very concrete designs and goal lines and milestones on exactly what it is we need to accomplish, which is why the, the, the reparations uh, in, in Proposal P was far much broader because it set a very clear path on what needed to be done, and we need to go back to that and not clearly embrace uh, the policies for reparation that were outlined in Proposal P. Okay. Mm -hmm. Next question, what should Detroit do regarding climate change? <laughs> so there are a lot of things we have to do. The first thing we got to understand is how we change, you know, the carbon footprint for what actually the city does and how it operates. So part of that means that we've got to move to more electric vehicles in, in the city's own fleet. When you look at the number of vehicles that the city actually owns and operates, and they're all using fossil fuel, why are we not beginning the process to transform our fleet to electric fleet? A good portion of that could be also building charging stations throughout the entire city so that you can encourage people who may want to buy an electric car, but they didn't figure out where am I going to get it charged at if, if, I, if I run out of juice and I buy it. The things we got to begin to set the infrastructure about to reduce 
the level of our carbon footprint. And that includes, on the other side, dealing with the issue of environmental racism or reducing the level of pollution that's being discharged into our own, our own area. We still are the number one area for non-attainment, for air pollution control, which is seriously really impacting our community. And we need to begin to reduce the levels of emissions of businesses that are actually operating here in the city of Detroit. Our people are being poisoned, poisoned by pollutants. They talk about the Stellantis plant, and I go back to it because they made all these great promises and benefits about what they were going to do, and now we find out that they can't figure out what the cause of the issue is with respect to people living next to a paint plant. Well, I can tell you it's real simple. It's the paint plant that's discharging. Begin to reduce the level of emissions that actually occur in the city, begin to transform the city's uh, infrastructure and, and fleet to reduce the impact of that, and then doing some things around sort of green conservation and technology. Why are we not... Uh, encouraging the planting of more trees in our community? Why are we not creating bioswells that we can have access and, and deal with water, stormwater runoff? There are a lot of environmental things we can do. There's, there's some uh, physical plant things that we can do. How are we not using more solar power in our own infrastructure ecosystem? I met a brilliant um, PhD guy who builds these windmills. And I was like, man, that's fantastic. You got a windmill. He, and he's got also got a solar power connected to it. I cannot recall the gentleman's name. He's got a shop right out there on Shane and, and, and Gratiot. But that's the kind of innovative thinking, creating art that's actually functional, that can use pumping so that when you have water in these, in these urban gardens where you don't have to, you use the rainwater, which takes rainwater out the storm system, and you pump it with solar energy and wind power. These are the kind of different things that we need to be thinking about in order to reduce our carbon footprint to create a much eco-friendly uh, environment for the people who actually live here. Okay, next topic is uh, based on research by Hood Research. Okay. <laughs> Detroit is more poor than Jackson, Mississippi uh, under two metrics, household income and housing value. And this data was uh, retrieved from the U.S. Census. How would you improve these metrics? Well, the first thing we have to do is we have to begin to unlock value in people's homes in the city of Detroit because we know historically uh, there was a guy who wrote a book, Andre Perry, uh, Know Your Value, which, which documented empirically that, that houses in majority of black cities are severely devalued compared to a comparable house that might be located uh, in a white community. Now, how do we address the issue of structural racism? Uh, clearly, there's some things that are inhibiting value in our city. A major inhibited value in the city is that we have the highest tax structure of any city in the state of Michigan. That is an inhibitor because we have, we have value that's trapped in the economics of the millage rate versus being trapped in the pocket of the homeowner. And so I've been thinking seriously about the issue of how do we eliminate and reduce property taxes in the city of Detroit because it's the lowest portion of revenue that we actually collect and it's been the most detrimental thing to leading to the depopulation and loss of houses in the city of Detroit. So if there's something we can do to unlock the value by keeping people in their homes and giving them the, the credit for the equity based on reducing their taxes, that's something we have to look at. We also have to look at how we deal with our assessments across the board and how we actually are doing our assessments. We know through a study that was done by the University of Chicago that there is, an, there is a glitch in the city's formula for how they actually value property. And if you live at the lower ends, or your property is at the lower ends of the spectrum, you're still being overvalued, overpriced, and overtaxed versus if you live in the high end. So how do we begin uh, to address that issue to make sure that we can free up value. And then by strengthening our neighborhoods and allowing people to invest in their homes and giving them the money, there's going to be a natural appreciation in value because if your neighborhood looks nice, chances are you can get a much better price. So if your trees are trimmed and your streets are clean and people feel safe in the community, then you're going to get more, more value for, for what your house is worth uh, in that particular situation. And the second part of your question? Well, essentially it was how do we improve those metrics. Okay, so, so the metric about income uh, is, is one that we have to attack in a number of different ways. One is we have to understand sort of what the skill level for the people, if I tell you the average wage is $30,000, that means most of these people are working in jobs that are not at an income level where it needs to be. 
Now we know there's been a depression in income value because now we see with COVID, they're starving for workers in the workforce and now they have to actually increase people's wages, which is a good thing. That's a good byproduct of COVID is that wages and people are finally being recognized as people who have worth and have value. The other side of the coin is how do we begin to train people and allow them to upgrade and increase the quality of the skills that they have. Most people are tend to be underemployed and undereducated. How do I put you in a training program that gives you a pathway to doing something different in your life and provides you with the support that you need in order to do that? Which means that if I'm going to help you upgrade your skill level, I've got to provide you with child care because you're not going to be inclined to be in a child attending a program if you can't properly have your kids uh, care for while you're in training. We have to use the resources of Detroit Employment Solutions Corporation, which receives hundreds of million dollars in job training grants and skills. We've also looked at the possibility of doing some type of guaranteed basic income. People say these are radical ideas and they're going to break the bank, but I'm saying, look, people are living under-resourced, under -waged. So I'm providing you with the opportunity to improve the quality level of your skills, to provide you with the chance to enhance your education, providing you with child support so that you can learn free of fear that your children are not being cared for. All these things are positive. And then we have to make, we have to attract and create more entrepreneurs in our own community. When you have the lowest rate of entrepreneurial growth of any major city in America, that is the issue. Because we all understand that the pathway to wealth is through entrepreneurship and home ownership. We're low on both accounts. So how do I provide resources to enhance entrepreneurship in our community? How do we support the businesses that are in our community so that people can actually have, go into entrepreneurship for themselves? Not everybody wants to look for a job these days. If you listen to my kids, it's all about how I get multiple streams of income. I'm not really concerned about a job. I'm trying to figure out how I can get rich a number of different ways, according to my kids. That's the mindset of a lot of our young people. We have to embrace that, and we also have to support the people who have had substandard education in a system that was controlled by the state of Michigan for more than 25 years, which really de devalued and destroyed public education in the city of Detroit and really created uh, people who, who lose kind of the critical thinking skills that you need in order to defeat an enemy that is well financed, um, that is purposed in maintaining control over the people who live in our community. Okay. I want to follow up on that. You mentioned some would refer to as curb appeal or house. So, what can the city do or should the city be doing to improve curb appeal? We, we got to make sure that the quality of life is good, and oftentimes in a lot of our neighborhoods, we have conflicts amongst our neighbors. So, I'm riding down Puritan Greenfield area today, and I see a guy parked in the front yard of his, of his house. That's a quality of life issue because I don't necessarily want to live next to somebody who parked in the front yard. You got drive the driveway was clear. He parked in the front of the house. That's a cultural issue which we have to address in order to begin to change how people think about their neighborhood so that the curb appeal of the neighborhood looks nice. The city also has to do their job in maintaining the, the roadways and the greenways throughout the city. When was the last time somebody saw a, a, a GSD truck come by and trim trees? Tree trimming in the city of Detroit lacks horribly, and yet you see overgrown trees which are creating a bad look in our community. If we trim the trees and clear the area up, it begins to look a lot better. And they, they've gone to some level of street cleaning, um, but it's not as robust as it could be. And I'm saying that part of the reason it's not as robust is we've got too many people downtown trying to do the job when the job should be done by the people in the community. So if we have a strong community organization, strong block club, uh, they can take on that responsibility. Let the power come from the people. Let not the people always be told what they have to do. The curb appeal is an issue that we have to address systematically. We gotta clear our, our alleys, and we gotta hold DTE responsible for a lot of alley clearing. They have our utilities in the alleyways. They're supposed to maintain and clear those lines. They need to get out in the community, clear the alleys so the people can see what's behind their houses. I can't tell you the number of stories I've had from people who told me that they found dead bodies in the alley because the alley is so overgrown. So the city's gotta do is basic responsibility of keeping the streets in good repair, of making sure that there's basic tree trimming and services that are done that if we can shift the responsibility uh, for empowering the communities to do the street cleaning and things of like that, then that's what we need to do. And at the end of the day, I think we also have to work on the, the cultural issues of people that we have conflict in our neighborhood. 
I saw a guy barbecuing one time on the, on the front porch of his house. And I have to admit, the barbecue smelled real good. <laughs> so, I mean, it smelled good. So, so, so I walked up to the house and said, hey, man, I said, well, at first, what, you barbecuing? He was barbecuing some ribs. And I said, but why are you doing it in front of your house? And I did it not in a way to offend them, because you, know, you got to be very careful about when you approach people and their conduct. But I was, I'm a nice enough person, and I established a little before. He said, I'm barbecuing in front of my house because my back porch has collapsed. And so his neighbors was mad at him because he was barbecuing in front of his house, but they didn't realize that it was an easy fix if we could have some money to help this guy fix the back porch of his house that he could do his barbecuing in the back of the house. Those are just kind of little, little things. You can't operate your car repair shop with 15 cars in your driveway. You just can't do that because it's dragging, it's dragging neighborhoods down. And then I was over on Evanston and Dickerson the other day, and I swear to God, this guy seemed like he was operating a furniture store in his front yard. And I asked, I asked the lady, she says, he actually has some good stuff in his yard. He said, but it's a, it's a headache because people line up all hours of day and night taking stuff out of, out of his yard, and this becomes a nuisance for the people who live in the neighborhood. People in the city of Detroit want, don't want anything different than what people want in all other neighborhoods. They want a nice, quiet street. They want to make sure that people are not driving down their streets at 100 miles an hour in a charger, and all these speed bumps, which is a cosmetic fix because it makes it seem like they're doing something, but they really ain't doing nothing um, to provide for the quality of life to make sure that people are comfortable in their homes, that they have nice parks with programming and services that they can do. At the end of the day, if we're providing a holistic approach to good neighborhoods, strong block clubs, when you have strong block clubs in Detroit, you didn't have a lot of this madness because people would go talk with their neighbors and say, now you know that's not right. How can we help you do what you need to do? If a guy's grass was tall, you didn't mind taking your line more than helping him cut his grass because it was impacting on you. The level of connection that we've lost in our neighborhoods, the people are just so unconnected with one another. It's, it's, we got to change it. And we have to work. And you got to have a mayor who understands that, who can speak to that. See, part of the issue is that the people in the city never hear him talk about anything unless it's something that's favorable for him. But I'm talking about issues that are painful, that deal with culture, that deal with race, that deal with economics. If you've never been impacted by these decisions, you really don't understand them. And so I can't expect you to fix a problem that you don't understand. You look at buildings and, and towers and skyscrapers, and I'm saying we got, you get Gavin Gilbert two and a half billion dollars, and we got three stories of, of, a, of a concrete elevator bay. And I'm saying, where is the investment in the people in the city and strengthening their neighborhoods? I got back to you. <laughs>
that will allow folks to go into these types of businesses to buy the party store, which is hard work. Don't get me wrong. Owning a gas station is hard work. But at the end of the day, if you own your own business, you have a better chance of improving the quality of your life than continuing to work with someone uh, at wages that are substandard in our own economy. Mm -hmm. Next question. What, if anything, would you do differently during your time in government? Well, what yeah, I would do is make sure I, get, I came out to the community on a regular basis and not in these sort of structured uh, uh, charter mandated meetings, which I always break up because as soon as the heat starts flying, you know, he runs out, he runs out like, a, like, a, like his cat is on fire. You got to come out in the community and you got to talk to the people who live here. And that's a commitment because I've always been a community person. I enjoy coming out because this is how you learn what the heck is going on and who's doing their job. So you got to be connected with the community and you got to, this got to be your passion. It can't be just a requirement. This has to be your passion because you have to be connected with the people. The second thing I would do is I would make sure that the people who work for me actually do the same thing. The people can't sit downtown and do their job effectively if you never get out in the field to see what the heck is going on in the community. How often times do you find people that they have, to, they have to use the GPS system to figure out how to get from one side of town to the other? Well, you should know, we should know where people live. You should know where things are in order to do something. I think there also is a level of compassion that I'm going to bring to the, to the table because of how I was raised and who I am that believe that we've got to understand that people aren't necessarily looking for you to give them something. They just want some, they just want some assistance. See, this is not a, a, this is a, it's a mindset that you have to have that people deserve the best that you can give them. That we are public servants. You see, we done got it twisted. They think that the, the people who elected think that the people work for them. No, we work for the people. The people tell us what we're supposed to do. I don't tell you what you're supposed to do. So the level of compassion that I bring to the table and the energy uh, and, the, and the intellect. I'm going to do a little bragging. Them. And the intellect. You know, I, I, I'm still a vociferous reader. I mean, I read, I go home at night and I read, I try to read something every day because I think you've got to understand what the issues are and where the trends are heading. And I think you have to have compassion, but you also have to kind of help show people the way for the future. What are the trends the cities are using in order to move people forward? How do we create a system of assistance that provides people with the steps that they need in order to make their life better? At the end of the day, if you have a mayor who is compassionate, who understands that people sometimes fall on hard luck. We all, we all not lucky. You know, we all work hard, but sometimes even work hard, you don't get the reward that you're entitled to. If you understand that, you understand that people need a safety net, if you provide it with, with services that they can afford, then I think you create a much better system for the people who live here, and that's the kind of mayor that I, that I will be. How can Detroit uh, increase home ownership? Oh. <laughs> the first thing we have to do is we got to help people whose house, who lost their houses, get their houses back. And I know a lot of that is, is, is a complicated structure because you've got people that lost their house as a result of tax foreclosure and it's been bought by some foreign investor who comes in who's now renting the house to the people. And so that's an economic it's an economic decision. What is it going to cost to get people's houses back from, the, from who they lost? Which is why I talk about, you know, the Michigan State Housing Development Authority and then providing some level of subsidy and support all for those mortgages so that they are actually affordable for the people who buy them. You know, there are a lot of creative programs in terms of interest rate buy down that can get the cost of a house down to a level where people can actually afford it. Now they say there's still, there's still a level of unfairness there because they lost it for taxes oftentimes that they should not have paid. But we gotta focus on home ownership. We also have to use the affordable housing dollars that the city has in their budget currently to create home ownership. I get sick and tired of them using these mixed finance uh, high rises and they have an affordable component on it and yet you're paying fourteen fifty hundred dollars in rent when you can have a mortgage for seven hundred eight hundred dollars in order to move in the house so while we're not using our dollars to sub supplement and support home ownership in our city that used to be the beacon of hope the north star that we all looked to because everybody owned their house back in the day and now don't nobody own their house so there's got to be a commitment to create home ownership 
to keep those people that are in land contracts, get them out of those extortionate land contracts. What's the pet? It's, it's, it's another scam that's being run on the people. I put you in a land contract, but the land contract don't never get paid. I'm trying to give you a mortgage, but the bank is not going to value your property because they devalue property in urban areas. So how do we deal with that? And we use that through the power and force of the money that the city has in its banks to ensure that lending takes place. And then we use our affordable housing dollars to put people in these home ownership situations. If we created more homeowners in our community, our neighborhoods would become more stable. Because when you rent a house, you might take care of that house, but you don't have any equity in that home. And we have to create equity in people that have lost uh, generational wealth. We've got to create that for the people who live here. Okay. Mm -hmm. What are the three biggest accomplishments in your career that you wish to highlight? I think there's so many. Let me just say that. Because I've been on... <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we, we just got to put it out there. You know, I can, we, we can talk about personal accomplishments or, or, or work accomplishments. So I think one thing I'm, I'm really proud of is the fight against emergency management that we led when I was president of the of Detroit Board of Education. You know, it was, and it's almost like this fight because you got a lot of people whispering in your ear telling you, man, it's time to just go along, get along, and let's just, and we're saying, look, man, we're not getting any level of respect. You get a guy that comes in here and he's like totally disrespectful to people. Totally, he just got here on day one, he already making decisions about impacting our children reducing class sizes and eliminating program design. So we took Robert Bob to court, and I remember Judge Wendy Baxter, who I give her much credit, because Robert Bob would never meet with the Board of Education. And so we were fighting back and forth. We ended up suing Robert Bob, and as a part of her order, she ordered him to have a community meeting with the Detroit Board of Education. I remember it was over at, it was Old Murray Wright, but next is now Frederick Douglass School. And it was the day when everybody who was mad at Robert Bob showed up. So, you know, that room was packed. <laughs> and the way they set the format up was I had a chance to question Robert Bob. And this is where your skills as a former litigator and just the knowledge of all you know. And I went, I did Robert Bob like I did my opponent on Let It Rip. I went up one side. <laughs> I came down the other side, and at the end of the day, literally, the community gave me a standing ovation. Now, you know, but you know the community, they, they get fickle sometimes on you, too. They give you a standing ovation on one day, then they'll be calling you a scoundrel the next. But that was a big fight. Um, actually, creating the first single-family housing subdivision in the city of Detroit, Victoria Park. I was, I was part of the, the team that put that whole project together to bring single-family housing back into the city of Detroit establish a cooperative working relationship uh, with uh, then Standard Federal Bank, is now Bank of America, where they financed all the houses in the subdivision in the city of Detroit, and they hadn't find, nobody had financed that type of project in the city of Detroit in years. I was also part of the team that brought commercial airline service back to uh, city airport with Southwest Airlines. I mean, that was a great uh, feat, political feat because what you were faced with was fighting from Warren and as well as fighting from our Canadian because the Windsor Airport is in the same airport path uh, as Detroit City Airport. A uh, very fantastic project which brought a lot of great things in the city. And then uh, allowing my kids and raising my kids to graduating from Detroit Public Schools. Uh, that was a great accomplishment because most of the time when people have the means to put their children in other schools, uh, they do so in our city. But I felt it very important that my kids need to be connected to the community that they lived in, you know, graduated. They graduated from Renaissance uh, and went on to, to, do, to do good things in our community. And just personally persevering, you know, working with Michigan Welfare Rights uh, on tenant advocacy issues, making sure that people can stay in their homes. The list of the things that I've done, because you do the work not to get credit, but you just do the work because the work needs to be done. So those are just a few examples. Oh, managing the city doing the Kwame Kilpatrick's issue. That was the most difficult management job that you could ever have in your entire life. Where you got a boss that's under fire every day, and you got a council that's, that, that don't want to do nothing because they just mad, trying to keep the city afloat. I tell everyone, I would wish that one day I would get the Spirit of Detroit Award for the outstanding service that I rendered uh, to the people in the community because that was some hard work. 
it was hard working and making sure that they didn't steal our water system because understand they came to the table because they had their agenda. Man, you know, now is the time for you all to allow us to appoint our own representatives to the water board. We said it's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. So, I mean, those are just some of the things, and I'm sure I'm missing the many small little things that, that you do in the community, whether it's working uh, in a food line, providing clothing and coats for kids and books and backpacks, just the stuff that you're supposed to do, because if you have the means to do it, then you should provide help and assistance for those that don't. And you do it not because you're looking for a pat on the back, but just because the work needs to be done. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's 5.30, okay. oh, and uh, we're, because we anticipated that, you know, your opponent may not show up, right. we invited a few other candidates to join you okay. on stage. All right. And, I, and one of them is a candidate, Adam Mundy, yes. who's a write-in in, in yes, District 3 for City Council. Adam Mundy! Oh, the other one is a candidate, Angela Calloway. Is she here yet? Uh, city Council candidate for District 2? She's not here? Not here. Oh, she is here? She's not here yet. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, she's not here. And then uh, re candidate Ricardo Moore, uh, candidate for Board of Police Commissioners in District 7, is also a write in. Yay, Ricardo Moore! Come on up. And, and we thought that we would have a discussion okay. amongst the three candidates. And uh, because, of course, uh, if you were to succeed to office, these are some of the things that you might do. So if you want to, maybe you can all sit on this side just so that you're all together. All right, we're all the same. Yeah, yeah or uh, I mean, you can stand up just because of the podium. Is. How would you deal with a crisis in your future positions like COVID? What would you do regarding the economy, you know, the health of the city, vaccinations? First of all, it's, it's very important to get prepared people who already have knowledge, skills, and abilities in those certain areas. One of my specialties is dealing with homeland security, which means that before an emergency even happens, there needs to be preparation and mitigation things put in place so that you can go into battle. You have to know your resources before the emergency happens. That's why one of the things when I was a police commissioner the first time, what we did, or at least I initiated, was moving Homeland Security from the police department to the mayor's office. Why? Because it has to be a more global approach to serve the citizens. So the first thing you have to do is get your resources in order, ensure that the people who are in place have experience in these positions to move forward. Okay. And, and as you're a candidate for Board of Police Commissioners, what, if any, would you do in conjunction with a city council or mayor's office in your position? You always work with them. Uh, and when I say work with them, you have to understand their positioning. Now, if they're going to kowtow and be submitted to the mayor or to the police chief and things of that nature, other commissioners, then that's problematic because your role is not to be a check and balance or rubber stamp. Your role is to be independent in thought and serve the citizens. These are the bosses up here. Anthony Adams spoke about that earlier. The citizens, the voters, are the bosses. So therefore, you have to be able to have open dialogue with folks, keep communication open, and ultimately be a policy-driven uh, person who understands what the rules exist, and you're able to communicate it. Okay. You know, just to kind of piggyback off of what uh, Mr. Moore was saying, you know, definitely, uh, well, first off, let's just say this. Uh, this pandemic has taken thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of lives. Uh, some of our friends, families, and, and to all those who have lost uh, family and friends to COVID, I, I extend my deepest sympathy to you. But um, I know one of the things I've been doing as I've been uh, campaigning throughout uh, well, for this particular campaign, I've actually had COVID tested. Uh, definitely want to make sure that COVID testing is done and encouraged, uh, not only throughout you know, each district, but just throughout the city. Uh, Morton Manor was, I was, I was actually pri uh, honored to uh, sponsor COVID testing at Morton Manor uh, Senior Citizens Home, uh, along with a few other places within my district. So one of the things is definitely letting the, uh, getting the word out and encouraging people to, uh, to try to get vaccinated, those who, who do believe in the science. Again, the science uh, tells the story. You know, this thing is a pandemic. 
again, it's wiping folks out left and right, day in and day out. And for those who are, uh, for those who don't believe in the science, you know, we need to try and, you know, find a way or avenue to try to at least get the word out, to try to encourage them to at least, if nothing else, look at what's being said, look at the, uh, the studies, and again, try to uh, encourage folks to get uh, uh, tested and uh, to get vaccinated, if so, so, so let me follow up. So, yeah. as a council person, would you say that during a crisis such as COVID, your uh, maybe biggest responsibility or first would be to advocate for vaccinations or the health, or would there be other things that you would do? Again, just to make sure that everyone knows what's going on, again, find the studies out for yourself. You know, a lot of times people go off of, off of hearsay and to, uh, to some degrees and in some examples, it's, it may not be the best advice or the best, uh, the best language that's being said to you. So again, my advice would be just to get, you know, get the, excuse me, get the studies, know what's going on for yourself. You have to make that conscious decision for yourself. This is all about your personal safety and those that are around you. And you know, your decision can not only impact yourself, but those around you, your family, friends, etc. cetera. Okay. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pose the same to you. So okay. as a city council person there, you have a board of police commissioner on your one side, the mayor on the other. Mm -hmm. What type of interaction would you be doing or do you think that you would do in this situation? Well, just again, with, with both sides, the, with the administration and the police commission, again, bringing everybody together to try to come up with some solution to make sure that we have a handle on this pandemic within the city. Again, the last thing that I would want to do as, as a uh, city elected official is to lose residents, you know, to this pandemic. So whatever we can do as far as from the, uh, from the uh, executive branch, legislative, judicial, even police commissioners, bring them all together, find, come up with some, uh, uh, some type of robust or comprehensive plan that we can get the word out to either encourage people to get tested and or vaccinated. Well, again, just to make sure that they understand what's going on out here, because that's what we need. We, we are the ones to, you know, to, to get the word out, to make sure that the information gets out to the people. We need to make sure it's out there readily. It's out there uh, being more proactive than reactive uh, when it comes to this. So, okay. I said, I believe that the whole approach to how we attack COVID was wrong. It was wrong from the standpoint that, um, we sat around for a year literally waiting on the vaccine to happen when people were dying because they had underlying health conditions that need to be addressed because there was an inadequate uh, disparity in access to health care treatment, that there was not a, a, a concerted effort to talk about how we actually get people healthy in the city of Detroit. And so we sat around a year literally watching TV and channel surfing when we should have been using the opportunity to bring information and, and issues to the forefront so the people can understand, yes, a vaccine may be coming, but how do we actually get you healthy now? How do we take an assessment of your current health conditions to see exactly whether or not you might be susceptible to the coronavirus? How do we help you get healthy? What is your diet? What are your underlying health conditions? We had the opportunity to work on all these things to identify people's issues so that when we finally got to a vaccine, we were in a much better position because I've started you on a healthy diet. I'm beginning to change my eating habits. I'm determining how you get access to healthy food in our community, which is, which is rare. Uh, how do we provide the access to the services, uh, health services for people to come out to your home so that you can interact and get what you need. So we missed the opportunity to get people healthy, I think, because we were waiting on a vaccine. Then when we get a vaccine, uh, there was a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of distrust in our community, but you know it's coming. So why are you not beginning to work early in the process to begin to give people assurances? Who's actually working on the vaccine? Who are these people? I understand that they have a lot of African Americans involved in the process of formulating the vaccination. Why were these people not being highlighted? I mean, I like Dr. Fauci, but Dr. Fauci wasn't the only one working on the issue. Mm -hmm. How do you break it down so that people can see people who they can relate to? Because this is all about how I relate to people. If, if, if I get a vaccine, chances are my wife gonna get a vaccine. And we're, we're vaccinated, I'm actually vaccinated and boosted. How do we make sure that the people who we need to influence, that we're using the right influencers? When I looked at some of those vaccine commercials from the Michigan Department of Health, I saw a lot of old tired faces on those things. The people don't need to be talking about nothing because their credibility has been compromised in the community any darn way. Mm -hmm. So how do we use young people, young influencers, get them in the mix? 
highlight them and what they're doing so that we can lower and reduce the gap of lack of vaccination. Then if people aren't vaccinated, then what is the protocol if you're going to do a job? Are you going to be subject to, to testing periodically? What do we need to do in order to do that? I think our approach was all wrong. It was a lot of fanfare, a lot of hype that was designed really to highlight an individual and quote what he, the great things he was doing. At the end of the day, we still end up with the lowest vaccination rate of any major city in America. And there's a constant pattern of that in this administration. Okay. Same, same to you. Mm -hmm. What would you do if uh, anything regarding your interaction with city council or the board of police commission? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that I have the same city council and, and police commission that this guy had. <laughs> That's going through. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. That, that was a joke. Yeah. You know, when you've been on the trail as long as we have, you know. You, you got to laugh. Yeah, you got to laugh at this. Uh, this is, you have to work together. And you have to work together and understand sort of the shared goals. We have shared goals and then we have district goals. We have police commissioning goals. You have to sit down and understand what each council persons, the district council persons district are. The citywide people are a little different because they, they have the same kind of perspective uh, as, as the mayor should have because they are citywide. So how do I sit down with Adam? Uh, how do I sit down with Letitia? How do I sit down with Angela to understand what their issues are? How do I sit down with Ricardo, with Commissioner Davis to understand what the issues and concerns are from their perspective? Because how this thing works effectively is that people have to communicate and understand what your goals and objectives are. What are you really trying to accomplish? To the extent that our goals align, then, then it's going to be much easier. To the extent that there is differences of opinion, then we need to sit down and understand what those differences are to work through them. But you hire us to work and communicate with other people. That's the, that's the nature of this job. You can't do it by yourself. And in fact, the more empowered and more effective the people are around you, the much more you can accomplish. So it's not about, it's not a zero sum game because it's not about, quote, getting all the credit. It's about getting the result for the people. That's what it's like. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other comments regarding this type of scenario that we're actually living right now? Well, just wanted to piggyback off of what Mr. Adams was saying. You know, definitely, uh, you know, District 3's uh, issues are just as it is uh, citywide. You know, I know a lot of the, uh, you know, things that, as it relates to the drainage fees, tax captures, over-assessment, you know, these are things that are citywide, but it definitely is having an impact here in, uh, in my district. And, you know, I'm, I, uh, I am pleased to see that we do have a councilman, or excuse me, a mayoral candidate who I uh, uh, endorse 100% that sees the same uh, issues in my district as, as he does uh, citywide, and uh, we plan on making sure that we, you know, do something about those issues and resolving them. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So the next scenario is uh, Ford and GM wants to build a new plant, and the first part of the question is, what would you do? The second part is, they asked for an economic package of $800 million. And so, you know, how would you respond to that? Anyone can go for So the irony of their decision to move out of the state is a reflection of the business climate that exists in the city of Detroit and really the, re the repressive nature of, of tax cuts and, that have gone on in Lansing that have made the state of Michigan very non-competitive. It's ironic that of all the states in the United States, the state of Michigan was the only state that literally lost population. And that's because we have a bad business climate, we have a bad personal climate because they cut so many services that made the city strong. I would not have been in favor of any, any subsidy for a project like that because we've subsidized too many projects and we haven't gotten the return on our investment. It's a bad business climate at the state level and it can't be made up by passing those, those uh, costs on to the taxpayers who live in the city of Detroit. We got to work on making our state competitive as an environment to ensure that our tax structure is fair, that it encourages investment uh, in, cap in human capital as well as, as, as physical capital, and do the things necessary to enhance the quality of life in our city. The things we have going for us, and I keep telling folk all the time, the city of Detroit is the most strategic city in the world because it has things that other cities don't have. We sit on the international border. We have a huge infrastructure of highways and freeways. 
We're located within three and a half, four hours of more than 60, 70 percent of the, of, the, of the nation's population. Uh, we have headquarters to many major businesses. We have a lot of assets that we undervalue and yet they appreciate. But you can't have a, a climate in the state um, that continues to push subsidies off and provide tax captures and abatements, and there is no return on investment for the people who actually live in the city. I mean, not, okay. I guess Adam just wants to give me you. to speak. So I, I just wanted to give you an opportunity. I guess my thing as it relates to the, the law enforcement, public safety piece as it relates to a relocation of any plant is to make sure that we're involved on the ground level. Businesses have money. They have money. The citizens pay taxes. So therefore, I want to make sure that there is an equal balance where the taxes that the citizens pay are not being subsidized to these businesses. We've seen that downtown with the Illages. We've seen it with uh, Gilbert. Mm -hmm. Gilbert. Mm -hmm. we, we've seen them all over. So I want to make sure that balance is met, you know, as it relates to police resources or any other type of resources aren't going to help the business who can afford their own security as opposed to the citizens which pay their taxes. You know, as a uh, former factory worker, I worked at American National Manufacturing and uh, during my tenure there, I was a UAW uh, elected official from 1996 until 2008. Uh, definitely as it relates to uh, tax abatements, as it relates to the big three, uh, specifically in this city, we have given enough right. tax abatements to uh, corporations, businesses, et cetera. Just look at how downtown and midtown is flourishing. They have money, but they also have those tax abatements. Meanwhile, again, our neighborhoods are, are, are suffering and lacking because of the lack of funding that's coming into the neighborhoods. You know, another example I, I just want to, you know, state real quick, uh, I have a, a factory that's in my district, Flexing Gate, yeah. and there is a serious issue when it comes to Flexing Gate and their policies and how they are actually, you know, uh, working out there to a degree where uh, the black people, are being uh, terminated before they're even made seniority uh, employees while they are training other uh, people who can't even speak English. And, and uh, they are actually getting those jobs as seniority employees. So uh, definitely there, there needs to be uh, some, some, some revamping, some, some re, uh, redirecting when it comes to how things are done, specifically when it comes to big businesses and those that are in the districts. So, so let me uh, follow up on that. Just in case not everyone is aware, of Flexing Gate. So Flexing Gate is a business. It's a factory. Uh, did they get city tax incentives or grants? Yes. 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 Okay. In fact, they were one group uh, who, right. who claimed that they were going to have 51 percent of Detroit of Detroiters to be uh, the workers. If I'm not mistaken, I'm, I'm I don't even think less. I think it's less than 17 percent or even lower than that right. are Detroit workers. And even again, the Detroit workers that are uh, told we're gonna have these jobs. First of all, you promised us a 20-something hour, uh, hour uh, wage. They're, they're not even receiving that. It's significantly less than what they were being told. And again, not on, only on top of that, they're not even being reached uh, seniority status. Right. So we definitely have an issue. And again, as a former union man, uh, solidarity blood is in, is, is in my blood. So uh, I have a problem with that, and that's definitely one of gonna, gonna be one of the things I address once I'm in office. So how would you uh, enforce then whatever provisions, if any, exist in the tax incentives that are given to companies like Flexing? Well, you know, and the only the, the, the problem I have when they are getting given these incentives and they're saying, well, you know, we'll cover our end of the agreement or we'll pay a certain fine. You know, that fine, in a lot of cases, they're making in a day. So yeah, we'll, you will pay the million dollar fine if we don't uh, live, up to our, live up to the agreement, but you're making a million point five in one day. So it doesn't matter to you, it's chump change to you. So we, we need to have more teeth that sink deeper into the skin and makes it a, a deeper ouch when it comes to uh, these folks violating the agreement. I don't know, maybe three, sitting, in, sitting in the cell for three days, maybe, I don't know. But we need to come up with some teeth that's stronger in these agreements when we're talking about these businesses coming into the neighborhoods and doing what they ever, whatever they want to do, which is a bullying, you know, uh, thing in my opinion. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's where the transparency comes in. We need more transparency when it comes to these type of agreements. Those type of uh, issues that Adam just addressed, the community should be well aware of what the contract is or what the negotiations are in advance so they can have input on it. 
And a lot of times they want to keep things in the dark and secret so that you don't know about it, so that you don't voice your opinion. Right. And that needs to be changed. Go ahead. And, you know, just even on that note, you know, when you're talking about including the, uh, the community, you know, that's the community benefit. You know, that's what we, when we're talking about community benefit agreements, that's what we want to do. We want to include the community. They have a stake in it just as well. They have to live, you know, right in this area day in and day out while the actual business owners may go across eight mile wherever they live. We're still having to live within this area of whatever you're doing in that area, be it. Uh, 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 chemicals or be it whatever hazards that you're trying to do, we need to make sure that number one, as you as a business owner, and I'm talking to every business in my district, you as a business owner will be and you shall be a benefit to this community. If you want to have your business in this community, you want to make sure that the folks in this neighborhood patronize you, you need to be a, a benefit to the community, period. I don't think there's too much more I need to add to that. I mean, obviously the oversight and enforcement of existing contractual provisions needs to be honored. They, those contracts need to be gone back through uh, with, the, with a fresh look to see exactly what hasn't been done. Uh, and since all these things are contractual, well, then maybe there's a breach of contract somewhere that some benefit maybe needs to be lost. But until they understand that they have someone on the 11th floor who's going to hold them responsible and accountable and who gives a wink and a nod to their noncompliance with these agreements, we're going to continue to get what we're getting. All right, so it's, it's now 5.50 p.m. Okay. And I think we just have enough time for some closing statements. And uh, we'll give each of you three minutes, and I'll time you for this just so <laughs> we got to be out of here at a certain time. <laughs> so, any, so, you know, I encourage you to say your name, <clears throat> the district you're running for, why people should vote for you, and so forth. So feel free, whoever wants to go first. Now you go. <laughs> now you with the mic. <laughs> I'll take the mic. <laughs> So in conclusion, again, my name is Ricardo Moore. I'm a write-in candidate for District 7, which is Northwest Detroit, Rouge Park area, Cody High School, McKenzie Noble, Cordes, Monier, Winnerhalter, Dexter Davison, the Northwest Corridor in Detroit. I served previously as a police commissioner in the city of Detroit, and my peers selected me or elected me to be vice chairman uh, from 2016 to 2017. The role of the police commission is a check and balance to the police chief. I don't work for the police chief. I don't work for the mayor. I work for you and your issues and concerns. I'm glad to see several members from District 7 present today um, here at this forum. My cell phone number, if you need to get in contact with me, whether you live in District 7 or not, crime does not stop at Livinois and Grand River and say, oh, I'll make a left turn and go down Grand River. It does what it wants to do. And I am uh, skilled in crime fighting. I am an expert in policing. And someone like me, they would love to keep quiet, but they can't keep quiet because I do know my stuff. So my number is 313-215-0398, 313-215-0398. If you have any questions for me about the police department afterwards or what have you, I'll be glad to stick around and answer them. Thank you. Nah, you know, people. Oh, wait, okay. So again, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming out this evening. Uh, my name is Adam Mundy. I am the write-in candidate for Detroit City Council in District 3. Uh, I'm a write-in candidate because of a, uh, a, 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 a peculiar situation, and if I, I'm sure I can see my time. So uh, April 12th, I submitted my petitions to the Detroit, uh, Detroit Department of Elections. I had a total uh, uh, signature petitions of 429 valid signatures. That's over 100 signatures required for me to get on the ballot. I also turned my uh, signatures in again April 12th. The uh, deadline to turn in the uh, signatures was April 20th. So I was very confident with over 100 signatures and uh, being uh, or having more than a week to actually turn in my petitions to a deadline and come to find out, all of my petitions were good. I was certified, received my uh, letter of sufficiency April 15th. As we all are well aware, the time period to challenge anybody was from April 20th through April 26th. That time period had come and gone now. We're in the middle of May, May 8th in fact. That's a Saturday. I received an email from Wayne County stating not only am I, only, uh, am I efficient and uh, sufficient on the ballot, I'm the only candidate 
running in District 3 that got on the ballot. So that was great news. It was just myself and the incumbent going into this November election. There was no primary. Great news. The very next week, now again, I said the challenge period to challenge anyone on the ballot was from April 20th through the 26th. May 13th comes. I received a phone call from one of my teammates stating that I was re uh, removed off the ballot. So I called Department of Elections. They told me a bogus story that somebody had sent in a challenge letter. Guess when? April 26th. It's May 14th, right? Excuse me, May 13th right now. So I went the next day, May 14th, to get the, this so called challenge letter. It was from Miller Law Firm, signed off by Butch Hollowell with no challenger and no specific reason as to why I was taken off the ballot. So that's the reason why I'm off the ballot. Well, the real reason is because they know I'm a direct threat to that incumbent and they know I can beat them. I have political experience working, going back as far as my days again, working at American Axle, local 235 on Holbrook. I was an elected union official. I negotiated the contracts with American Axle and the UAW. Uh, once American Axle decided to leave Hope, excuse me, <clears throat> leave Holbrook, I began working in city government. I worked for four different city council people in the last nine years, so I have the institutional knowledge, the know-how, and the know the, the, uh, the way to get the, uh, the job done at the table. I know how to vet contracts. I know the RFP process. And I know how to make sure that things get done within the district that I'm representing. I'm all about the quality of life here in, uh, not only in District 3, but just the city as a whole. The American Rescue Plan gave this city millions of dollars. None of it has come into the district to do any type of infrastructure, to repairs for anything for the senior citizens. We have a drainage fee that is killing my businesses, black-owned businesses. It is closing my churches in my neighborhoods. We need to find a way to erase and get rid of this, uh, this so-called drainage fee. We have, is it my time? Your time. <laughs> can, can I just get my information? I, I would just like to get my information. If, if uh, My phone number is 313-699-6140. My website is www.mundy, M-U-N-D-Y, the letter excuse me, the number four, the letter D, and the number three. My email is adammundy43 at gmail.com, and my Facebook is adammundy for District 3. Please write in, okay. Adam Mundy, A-D-A-M-M-U-N-D-Y, District 3. Thank you very much, and God bless. And I, and I want to note, good, good job, that uh, let Ricardo spell his name as well. You're also a writer. Right, so. that's correct. How do you spell my name? R-I-C-A-R-D-O. M-O-O-R-E. If you have trouble remembering it, just think of Ricardo Montalban from, uh, Ricardo. what's the name of that show? Uh, Fantasy Island. Fantasy yeah. Island. Yeah. The plane, so that's the, the same, the plane, the plane. That's <laughs> right. So R-I-C-A-R-D-O-M-O-O-R-E. Okay. Thanks, Henry. And again, District 3, I like to just let everyone know the, uh, my, I call them my five, five, or five, five zip codes. So if you're in 48203, 48205, 48212, 48213, and 48234. I need you to be voting and writing in, Adam, Monday, for your next city council. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, first off, I want to thank uh, Hood Research for this uh, stimulating uh, debate. Um, my name is Anthony Adams. I'm running for mayor of the city of Detroit. About a month ago, there was an email that was distributed um, by Maureen Taylor. And the email was captioned, there are only two candidates in the race. Two candidates in the race. And she went down and proceeded to talk about all the things which differentiated the candidates in this race for mayor. A candidate who's concerned about water versus one who's not. A candidate that's concerned about housing versus one who's not. A candidate that's concerned about crime versus one who's not. A candidate that's concerned about your children and the one who's not. This is a stark contrast between two people. It can get no clearer than that. Either you got a guy who you know, who's worked with you, who's been in the community, whose children went to this community, who's been to every play field in this community, every rec center, or a guy who doesn't know about our community and is not connected with the people who live here. I'm offering you a clear choice to create a new paradigm in the city of Detroit, to create a new vision of spirit of cooperation, where we can work together to create great things for our city. 
I know earlier in the conversation, you know, I got kind of choked up, but that's the passion that I bring to the job. That's the, that's the commitment that you're going to hear from me. So my name is Anthony Adams. I am on the ballot, so you know how you just, you just circle in the dot. <laughs> my website is anthonyadams4mayor.com, F-O-R-Mayor.com. My uh, phone number is 313-688-6032. My email is aa the number four mayor at gmail.com. I will go any and everywhere. Just speak to any and everyone because I'm trying to win your support. Again, the momentum is on our side. Yes, they are scared crapless because they don't see the numbers that they thought they were going to see at this point in time in the race. The victory is ours to claim it. Let's create this great political victory so that the people in the city of Detroit can win. Thank you. houses because other people in other states are buying them very, very quickly and we live right here in the city of Detroit. How come we can't get any? Right. right. That's what I like to know. <laughs> so I, I call it the Detroit first housing strategy. Because we all know that the land bank, the land bank play a game with people from Detroit. That's what they do. So there's a vacant house next to you, you want to buy, or there's a vacant lot. They always seem to have a thousand reasons why you can't get that lot. Okay. And so part of is dealing with the leadership of the land bank. The leadership of the land bank needs to be completely cleaned out. I've already advocated I'm going to abolish the land bank. They said you can't do it by law. I said, but it didn't tell you you could not stop the transfer of responsibility to someone who needs to do the job. So we will change the policy that is that we will change the policy that Detroiters will get access to the housing to the lots first. Right. Yeah. Well, see, I actually believe that if there's a vacant lot <laughs> next to you, you really should get that lot for free. I mean, it's already been paid for. So why are we charging people? I mean, I know there's some there's some costs associated with transferring the deed and all that, but at the end of the day, we've already paid for the land. We pay for the house. It's sitting there. If you're prepared to do something with that house, and I'm not telling you to put you under this six month six month restriction where everything got to be done in six months because you can't get your plans improved in less than five or six months. You can't even get financing for the house. So we got to we got to remove the barriers, the transfer of the ownership of the property to the people in the city of Detroit. At the end of the day, we need to be encouraging more ownership of people who live in our community. Owning land is the quickest way to create wealth for yourself. We have to have policies that encourage that. That is the land bank. The city transferred through with the 